cast your minds way back to 2003, the last of the Lord of the Rings films, The Return of the King. You're lucky that I wasn't Vicar of St. Matthew's during the Lord of the Rings. I had a lot of sermon illustrations from the, from the films. But this is a really good one. Aragorn and Legolas and Gimli are forced to travel the dim Holt Road known as the Paths of the Dead. They go in under the mountain, even though the door says the way is shut. And in the caverns under the mountains, they find skulls and skeletons. And then they are confronted by the spirits of the dead who cannot rest until they have fulfilled their oath to the heir of Gondor. Aragorn, of course, is the heir, and he commands them to fight for him, which they do, and they are then released from their torment and able to rest in peace. Some of the best scenes of the movie. Can't believe it was 2003, although, of course, true Believer fans such as myself have watched it many times since. Could probably quote you some of the lines. Then just last week during the Arts Festival, there was a show with a similar theme, and this time not a fantasy movie, but a, a real life story. The Bone Feeder is a new opera by Gareth Farr. I'm sure some of you saw it. Anyone see The Bone Feeder? A few, I know Claire did. Claire's husband was the uh, conductor for it and the music was fantastic. If it comes back again, you really must see it. It's the story of the early Chinese community in New Zealand. In 1902, so around the time this church was being built, in 1902, many of the Chinese families in New Zealand had arranged to have the bodies of their loved ones who had died, to have their bodies sent back to China for burial. And as the show program recounts, on October the 26th, 1902, the steamship SS Ventnor left Wellington bound for China with 499 coffins. The Chinese families believed that if they did not return their loved ones home, then they would become hungry ghosts roaming the land, and the, the, uh, those who were deceased would be unable to care and protect for their families, and also the families couldn't properly bury them and care for them in return. And so the ship left, but tragically, the ship struck a rock at Cape Egmont sink and then sunk as it limped towards the Hokianga Harbour, and 13 lives were lost. Over time, the coffins floated ashore to be found by the people of Te Roroa and Te Rawa Iwi. Local oral history tells, of this, tells the secret of the bones found and then buried and kept safe until the families could come for them. And 100 years later, in 2013, this at last came true when a delegation of Chinese, the descendants and kin of those lost, traveled to the north to thank the iwi for the guardianship of their loved ones. And the Baisan ceremony was performed in order to feed the bones, the laying and offering of food in order to feed the bones and finally satisfy the hungry ghosts. The opera tells the story in a very moving and also at times quite humorous way. The actors who are the ghosts are restless until they find peace when their descendant arrives to pay them due honor. I think the prophet Ezekiel would have liked the bone feeder and he would have liked the return of the king because Ezekiel was a pretty dramatic kind of a guy. Ezekiel was a prophet of Israel who lived in the, in the years 500 BC and he was exiled with the children of Israel to Babylon. Ezekiel starts out his life pretty much as a prophet of doom. Basically, everything is bad. The people have got what they deserved. He would go into a trance, and then he would relate visions that he saw. And often he'd act them out. Once, once he ate a scroll with the words of God on it and declared them sweet to taste. Another time he took bricks and built a model of the siege of Jerusalem and kind of acted it out for the people. 
Another time, he lay down on one side for 390 days because that was the number of years that God was going to punish the people for. And then another time, he shaved his head, burning some of his hair and scattering the rest to the wind, again, to show what was going to happen to the people. All rather dramatic and probably pretty crazy. But as time goes on, Ezekiel comes to have more hopeful messages and begins to teach the pe people new ideas and new concepts. They have had to deal with being exiled from their homeland, which is bad enough, but they've also had to deal with being exiled from the temple. Their place of worship has been destroyed. We sang that hymn this morning, we love the place, O God, wherein thine honor dwells. Some kind of, some of those old fashioned concepts of God residing in a holy place. And that is what the people of Israel thought about the temple. So if the temple had been destroyed and they had been exiled, well, where were they gonna find God? They have to find a new way to relate. And Ezekiel teaches them what we would think of as a very modern concept. He teaches them that God can reside in their hearts. Ezekiel says, I will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanness and from all your idols I will cleanse you. A new heart I will give you a new spirit I will put within you. I will remove from your body the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. We've had that line in our liturgy all Lent. I will put my spirit within you and make you follow my statutes and be careful to observe my ordinances. Then you shall live in the land that I gave to your ancestors and you shall be my people and I will be your God. The idea that God could be found within the people instead of just within the temple or just in the land of Israel was very radical and very new. But Ezekiel begins to, begins to bring hope to the people that they will be able to return home as well once God is in their heart. And so Ezekiel has the vision that we heard read this morning, the valley of the dry bones. And even though it seems to start out a bit unhopeful, it becomes a hopeful text. At the beginning, Ezekiel can only see devastation. He sees a valley and it's full of dry bones, like Aragorn entering the valley of the dead, or the tragedy of 499 coffins lost at sea. It seems at the beginning there can only be sorrow and only loss and fear. And Ezekiel is told to prophesy to the bones, to cry out to them, in sorrow maybe, but also in hope. He's told to speak life to them. The power of the word of God can be that strong. And so in his vision, he sees the bones recreated into human beings and the breath, the spirit of God, fills them. I will put my spirit within you and you shall live. The spirit and breath in Hebrew, ruach, are the same thing. So breath, breathing in, is the same thing as the spirit of God. And so the spirit and the breath comes into the, into the vision and the message is that the people can begin to have hope that one day they or their descendants will have life again, that they will return home. And sure enough, 70 years later in 520 BC, they do return and they do build the temple again. Ezekiel's way of communicating and way of getting across his message is very physical. And yet he also integrates the physical and the spiritual. Our modern Western world often separates those two things. Spiritual is somewhere kind of ethereal or maybe something you find in church and the physical is something else. But in Ezekiel, we see them already brought together. The breath, the spirit is within the bodies and cannot be separate from them. 
When we look around at our world and we look at ourselves, where do we see valleys of dry bones? What kind of vision would we have? We might see the famine that's going on in the Sudan. We might see places of drought. We might see people struggling with poverty in our own land. Or maybe your own life at the moment feels a bit like a valley of dry bones because of some loss or grief that you're experiencing. Or maybe life is just plain boring and it just feels like dry bones. And so our rather crazy prophet Ezekiel invites us to prophesy, to speak, to claim the Spirit of God. Ezekiel invites us to breathe in, to breathe in a life-giving breath, and then to seek to transform our experience or maybe the experience of others. Our Christian life and prayer is not a magic wand that can make all the bad things go away, but we can bring change and hope for ourselves and for our world when we seek a new spirit, when we seek a heart of flesh and not a heart of stone, like the stones that you laid down this morning. This passage from Ezekiel is one that we'll read again in a couple of weeks on Holy Saturday at the Easter Vigil. As we gather in the darkened church, we will imagine the darkness of the tomb of Jesus or the tomb of Lazarus, and we will gather and listen and wait. We'll hear read the story of creation, the story of the people passing through the Red Sea to freedom, and then we'll hear the Valley of the Dry Bones. And each reading will help us set the scene. Each reading will remind us of God's action through the ages, and each one will prepare us to welcome Jesus, who, like Lazarus, walks from the tomb. This year, in the spirit of Ezekiel and dramatic actions, we're going to open up the baptismal pool, which is under the floorboards at the back of the church, and we're going to invite you to walk down into it, not in the wa- in full of water, so you won't have to wear your togs, but we're going to walk down into it and up the other side. As we've been walking to the font each Sunday in Lent to lay down our burdens symbolized in the stones, we're going to walk down into our imaginary valley or our imaginary tomb, and we're going to walk up the other side with God's ruach breathed into us. It'll be our little attempt to be like Ezekiel. And we'll remember his words, prophesy, mortal, speak, proclaim hope, proclaim life, Be ready for the Spirit to be alive within you. And we will see that Ezekiel's vision can become real for us if we claim it and if we choose to speak and if we act.